over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, Dave here is going to hand some vials around, and we'd like you to take a quick sniff of them and then pass them on to the next person. Please, please do return them at the end, otherwise we can't give any more lectures because this is all that we've got. Um, normally, you would expect to see scientists in white lab coats. We're in red, so if something goes wrong, we can hide the blood and carry on and finish the talk, okay? But you'll all be okay. Okay, so um, I'm an inorganic chemist. That means I work with uh, compounds that contain metals as well as organic groups. The reason I got into chemistry is uh, actually because of uh, a solution not dissimilar to this one that I was shown when I was about 12. Now, does anyone here think they might be able to identify what this is? Any guesses? Yeah? Copper sulfate. Copper sulfate, very good. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone talks to me about a metal, I expect to see something that's shiny and quite hard. So for me, it was quite a revelation that you could have a metal in solution and it's blue. And it's quite a beautiful blue as well. So this set me on the course, which basically <laughs> resulted in me being here today talking to you about chemistry, uh, because I wanted to know why this was blue, okay? Because it's quite beautiful, and I, I now know the answer to that. So if you want to know, I can tell you at the end. Now, chemistry is a difficult subject. There's no denying that. But I think it's a really rewarding subject to study because it really is fun. You're working with molecules and making new types of matter all the time. But there's something much more important than the fact that it's fun, and that's that it's fundamental to absolutely everything you do in your life. So, quick straw poll. Who in this room has a mobile phone? Okay. The people who haven't yet put their hands up. Do you have a, an MP3 player or something like that? iPod? Yeah? Ever taken something to cure a headache? Almost everyone. Yeah? Okay. Whether you've ever stopped to think about it or not, chemistry is absolutely everywhere and it underpins your life, but it's spread out so much and affects so many things, you probably missed it because it's in the background and so obviously so that you overlook it really easily. So what I'm going to do in this very short time slot which I've got is basically talk through a few concepts which I think are really key to chemistry in general. And the first one is the one that usually elicits groans, which is thermodynamics, okay? Because this is numbers and energy. And uh, here we see that uh, there's a problem with thermodynamics. Uh, Goldilocks has got a problem because the bowls aren't hot in the right order. So I'm just going to do a, a quick little demonstration to show you something about the energy of systems. So I've got some special little gels here. And what they are is they're a mixture of ethanol, which normally if you set fire to it, it would be gone very quickly because it burns quite well. But we've mixed it up with something which slows down the burning process. So this should uh, keep going for quite a while. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sprinkle some metal ions on. And uh, this is uh, copper nitrate. And it's actually a very nice blue crystalline solid. So does anyone think they know what color it should be in the flame? Sorry, red? No? Try again. Yeah? Green, very good. So the past three groups have been talking to each other, so clearly they haven't talked to you guys and primed you with the answers. So, that's, that's a pretty interesting colour, isn't it? Yeah, I should say, if you can't see at the back, please do feel free to stand up. <clears throat> now, this is sodium chloride. Does anyone know what the more common name for sodium chloride is? Salt. Salt, absolutely. You can buy this in a supermarket without any problems, but if you order it from a chemical company, it's got to come in a special plastic tub with all sorts of safety warnings attached to it. But there you go. Who says health and safety hasn't gone mad? Now, this is now yellow. Anyone think they know why it's yellow? Yeah, absolutely. It's down to the sodium ion. The transition's going on there. And now we have strontium nitrate, finally. So any predictions on the colour for this? Red. Red. Red, yeah. So your original guess is right. <coughs> Actually, it's more orangey nowadays. So you've got some very different colours from these metal ions when they're excited by the energy from these flames. And that's all down to their electronic structure. And the distance, distances that electrons are travelling is very closely related to the nature of the energy and therefore the wavelength of light 
which is uh, interacting with them, and therefore you get these different colours from these systems. <coughs> now, thermodynamics is just one part of the jigsaw puzzle that we call chemistry, because thermodynamics is telling you whether something can happen, but what's just as important is where, how something happens if it's allowed to happen. Now, this is the math behind kinetics, um, fairly straightforward, and I won't <laughs> be going through it in great detail because it's a bit mathematical and a bit dry. So I thought I'd do something that's a little bit more qualitative and a bit more appealing to look at. So if you look here, there's a temperature scale on the right-hand side, and you see at the top is 100 degrees C. Now, that's the temperature that water boils at. 22 degrees C further down is about the temperature of this room, and 0 degrees C is the temperature that ice will freeze. The lowest temperature ever recorded on the face of the Earth is minus 89 degrees C, and that was down in Antarctica, which this is a photograph of. If you go even further down, you get liquid nitrogen. Now, 70% of the atmosphere is made up of gaseous nitrogen, but if you cool it to minus 196 degrees C, then you can force it to become a liquid. So Dave here is just going to take a little bit of uh, liquid nitrogen out of this pressurised dewar here. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> now you saw a great big plume of what looked like steam there and in essence it was steam except when water boils and gives off steam that's at 100 degrees C this is liquid nitrogen and it's boiling at minus 196 so it's much colder you're practically 300 degrees C colder so this is a very cold liquid which we're putting into this little dewar here just to finish this off if you go down to minus 270, you've got the temperature of interstellar space. So that's pretty cold. And right at the bottom here, you've got absolute zero, the temperature at which you cannot go any lower. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off a chemical reaction at our 22 degrees C, and I'm going to cool it down to that minus 196, and I'm going to prove to you that I can stop that reaction. And then I'm going to put it in some hot water and switch the reaction back on again. So that's just some hot water. It's nothing any more dangerous than that. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to demonstrate this with some glow sticks. So, okay, so that's now glowing. And any good scientific experiment should have a control. So this is going to be my control, which I'm going to put here. And then we'll break another one. Okay, so quite evidently there's a reaction occurring here. Normally when reactions occur, heat is given out, but sometimes light can be given out instead, which is what's being exploited here in this glow stick. So I'm going to dunk that in the liquid nitrogen, and it's going to take a little while to quench it, but it will quench. <coughs> right. Cue some hot water. Now, it's getting dimmer, but this takes a little while to happen, so what I'll mention in between, this is a fairly quick reaction to start and a reasonably quick reaction to stop. What I've got here in this vial, is what, uh, in this flask, is what we call a chemical garden. Now, this reaction's been going on all day. So there's metal salts in an ionic solution in here. Now, I can't really show it on the screen, but please feel free to come and have a look at it afterwards because it's quite beautiful to look at. But this has taken all day to get to where it is, whereas this reaction has now stopped. So if I can just compare it, as you can see, it's not glowing anymore. Okay. Now I'm going to drop it into the hot water. And again, this may take a little while. But what we're now doing is we're giving energy back to the system, which was taken away by the liquid nitrogen. And what you should see is it should start to come and glow again. So hopefully you can see at the back. And if I turn this around, you can see there's a rather odd green blob on the front. And that's because the, the glow stick has cracked because we've just changed the temperature by 300 degrees C. So we've really stressed the plastic container that this is in. So if I start jiggling it around a little bit, 
this material which is in here and reacting is now starting to come out into our solution. But I would hope you would agree that that's a pretty good demonstration that you can stop a reaction and start it again just by manipulating the temperature of the reaction. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now, anyone know what they are? Louder? Hands. Excellent. That's every group got that right so far. <laughs> now, there's a left hand and a right hand there. I want you all to put your hands up like this. And then you're not allowed to twist your hands. You've got to try and put your right hand on top of your left hand and make it so that it doesn't look any different than a left hand. So do you think you can do that? Has anyone succeeded? No, right, it would be a first if you succeeded, okay? Because everyone here has a right and a left hand. Now, this is quite an important concept in chemistry, which is what we call chirality. So carbon is the backbone for life as an element, and it likes to bond to other elements, usually making four bonds in total. And when it does this, it forms what we call a tetrahedral shape. If we have four different groups, which are here represented by the four different colours, we can arrange these groups in two different ways, which we call enantiomers of each other. There is no way, if you rotate that right-hand molecule around, that you can superimpose it on the left-hand molecule. It cannot be done because they're mirror images of each other. You might say, well, okay, that's maybe interesting, but why should I care? Well, what you've been smelling in those vials is this molecule called carvone. And there's two forms of it, two hands, if you like, which are enantiomers of each other. What you see here is that this molecule has this big group coming out of the page. But if you flip that molecule so the oxygen was on the right-hand side, that big group would have to be going into the page. But on this enantiomer, it's coming out the page. So they have different hands. And it's the smell receptors in your nose that can pick up different smells. So some of you will have smelled spearmint and then fennel when you tried the different variants. Now, just out of interest, did anybody here not find any difference in the smells? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's more than the last group. Normally, about 30% of people can't tell the difference, and that's entirely down to your genetics. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means you can't tell the difference between these particular enantiomers of this molecule. <clears throat> and that's because... For some of you, your receptors can tell the difference between one form or the other, but for some of you, you cannot distinguish, so it will just smell all the same to you. And where this becomes really important is when you think about when we use drugs to try and treat people for illnesses. So have you all heard of thalidomide? Yeah. So it was supposed to help uh, pregnant women with their morning sickness. There's a problem... Only the left-hand form does that. The right-hand form is actually a mutagen and interacts with your DNA and causes cancerous growths and uh, birth defects. And, of course, no one realised at the time when they put this out on the market that there was two possible variants of it. So now people spend a lot of time and money understanding the relationship between the structure of a molecule and what it actually does biologically for you. So if you ever go to the doctor and get prescribed something you see your drug in the package, what you don't see is the enormous amount of work which went into figuring out which one was good for you and which one wasn't, and then separating them as well. And the ultimate example of this is DNA. DNA holds the secret of life, but it is just one really big organic molecule with some phosphate groups in it. And because it has this twist, this helix, which you can think of as being clockwise or anti-clockwise, you can see how there's grooves, and they have a particular shape. And it could be that one hand of a molecule will fit into that shape, but the other hand won't. And then that's how these molecules interact with your DNA, either in a positive way or a negative way. So this is a really important thing to understand. <clears throat> now, another theme is the phases of elements and what their impact is on the environment. I put it to you, the polar bear on the top is a bit happier than the polar bear on the bottom... <laughs> 
because polar bears have not evolved to balance on lumps of ice in the middle of the ocean. Okay? But this is the, possibly the direct consequence of climate change. And of course, what's the molecule that's supposed to be predominantly behind climate change? Well, it's carbon dioxide, a very simple molecule, but potentially very important. And carbon dioxide has some really odd properties. So it can interact with another carbon monoxide very, very weakly, so you can get it as a solid. But what carbon monoxide does is it will sublime. Now, does anyone know what sublimation or subliming is? Yeah. Very good. Now, that means there's no liquid in this equation. Okay? So I've got some solid carbon dioxide here. So it's just little pellets. Uh, it's at minus 78 degrees C. Okay? So you think about if you hold a, an ice cube in your hand, after a while it starts to hurt. Well, this is 78 degrees C colder, and I can tell you it's already starting to hurt my hand. So I'm going to put it down now. Now, you can kind of see it subliming off the top here, but you shouldn't take my word for it. So I'm going to do an experiment to prove to you that carbon monoxide does indeed sublime. So we're going to fill up these little tubes. <coughs> And I promise you I'm trying to get the quantities roughly the same. And then like all good experiments, we wait. If nothing happens, then you know I've been lying to you and it doesn't sublime. If it does sublime, it'll do something else. And I swear to you, it has a mind of its own. It takes as long as it feels like. <laughs> so I haven't been lying to you. However, this is the control and it still hasn't gone yet. There we go. So I've proved to you that carbon dioxide sublimes. However, we don't like to do things by halves at Nottingham University. So I thought we'd try it on a slightly bigger scale. <coughs> so just amuse yourselves for a moment. It takes a, a while to fill up because it, it's quite deep. <coughs> Okay, nearly there. Now, there's some very nice portraits in this room, so I have to make sure that I aim for the window because it's the least damageable bit in the room. And this is normally quite quick, and having said that... Wow. So that's the first time we've gone through the curtains. Okay, so carbon dioxide sublimes. But there's another interesting thing in terms of its chemistry, and we really do need to understand this if we're going to think about the environment, which is pH. Okay? Now, <clears throat> human beings are not very good at adapting to more extreme environments. If you think about it, in here, we're quite happy sat in here in T-shirts and perhaps even shorts for some of you. If we drop the temperature to zero degrees C, everyone would want a fleece and a coat and a scarf pretty quickly. It's the same with pH. We don't have a lot of tolerance. And what's quite important is that we understand how CO2 can uh, interact with the environment. Because one idea to cut down on the huge volumes of carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere is to pump it under the sea and use the pressure at those depths to keep it liquefied. However, what if it gets out? What will it do? Well, there's a way to test this. So is everyone familiar with the universal indicator scale? Yeah, so that's what this is. So I just so happen to have a solution here. So judging by that scale, what would you say the pH is? Yeah, 11, 12. In other words, it's, it's basic. Okay? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of CO2, and I want you to call out if there's any colour changes and what they are. Okay? So are we ready? Excellent. Call them out. Yellow, yeah. <clears throat> okay, that was pretty quick. Now, what do you conclude about the pH of this solution now? Two, right? Really acidic. So, we're down in the lemon juice slash vinegar slash stomach acid territory. And all I did was add a little bit of CO2 to a solution. But of course, what's happened is CO2 reacts with water, and especially if there's hydroxide anions around, to give you carbonate, and carbonate is very acidic. So just by adding a neutral molecule, we've made a much more acidic solution. So clearly that's something we need to think about, and we need to understand the chemistry of carbon dioxide. Now, as said in the introduction, I work with depleted uranium, I would have loved to have brought some here, but funnily enough, there's a lot of paperwork involved moving uranium around, so it wasn't really on. And we make molecules which uh, don't really sit around on the bench. They kind of burn in the air and set fire to things. So again, this is a very nice room. The Royal Society pays my wages. I think that would stop very quickly if I burnt the place down. So we decided what we would do is we put together a short video just to um, show you a, a little hint of the kind of chemistry that I'd get involved with. This is just oil sat on the top, so just like we had to have oil to protect the potassium, uh, we also need oil to protect the uranium turnings. If you really finely divide uranium turnings, they're pyrophoric, which means they burst into flames in the air. Normally they look really black under the oil, but as we've got them out and we've thinned them out a bit, you can already start to see shiny edges on them because actually that's the, the true colour of uranium. It was originally a block of uranium and it was machined on a lathe, which has just turned it all out as little turnings because that's much easier for us to handle because it's got a bigger surface area. This is uranium tetrachloride. Uh, it's solvent free, it's a nice free flowing emerald green powder. And here's another form of uranium. So this is uh, uranyl dichloride, uh, which has got two organic molecules coordinated to it as well. So there you go, some uh, naked uranium. I mean, to the eye, that would look like just any other metal. And to all intents and purposes, because the radioactive component is gone, that's all it is. It's just another metal in the periodic table. Only it's the boogeyman. That's what we like to say. <laughs> have this one handy as well. <clears throat> Let's give this a go. Oh, <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> I told you it was Christmas stuff. Sorry, who says zinc's boring? <laughs> so the backstory to that is one of my colleagues said that zinc's really boring and you can't do anything interesting with it, so we thought we had to prove him wrong. And as you can see, if you pick the right combination of elements, you have a pocket flamethrower, which is <laughs> occasionally handy. Um, so this is uh, part of a periodic videos project we do at Nottingham. So we are on YouTube and we've done a video for every element in the periodic table. Uh, after a mound of paperwork, two years and some security checks I can't tell you about, we got let into the National Nuclear Labs. So we've done videos on plutonium and miscellaneous other radioactive elements that you'll never ever see, never mind hear about any chemistry of. So they're going to come out soon. If your school blocks YouTube, we have a sister site, which is www.periodicvideos.com, and there you can start with the elements, but we, we do videos on molecules as well. Uh, we really don't mind making fools of ourselves as long as we can get chemistry across to people and out of the uh, academic spires. And uh, that's uh, a picture of the team, or most of the team, that do these videos. Okay, so I haven't had very much time, unfortunately, to talk to you today, but I hope uh, you've had a a bit of a hint of what chemistry can do and how it can be interesting and fun. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to take questions. <coughs>